Good evening, everyone. I'm Reverend Julianne Lepp. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Eau Claire. And we're going to have a forum called Poetry for the Planet. This is our second to last forum of the year. We're so glad to have you here. We have local poets, and um, we'll be hearing about uh, why our poets write what they do, as well as a connection to the planet. And uh, we will be starting with um, Lopamudra Basu. Thank you, Reverend Julie, for inviting me again to uh, uh, this event. I think I was here last year. Um, it's great to see so many of my poet friends here. It's also intimidating to be the first one because of alphabetical order to be reading, but I'll do my best. Uh, my name is Lopa Basu. Uh, I'm a professor of English at University of Wisconsin Stout. Uh, though I live in Eau Claire, I, I work in Menominee. Um. Um, and why do I write? That's a very difficult question to answer. This time these poems were written because Julie asked me to think about the planet and write. It's a, it was an assignment. I told her at first I don't really write about the earth, but uh, she said you, you can find something. So uh, the, <clears throat> the first poem was actually inspired by a concert which many of you might have uh, been to. The Chippewa Valley Symphony Orchestra recently had The Suite of the Planets by Holst. And, you know, uh, Jan wrote a, po a, poem, I mean, a couple of poems there. So that inspired me to write the first one. It's called The Earth Suite. When Galileo looked through his convex lenses 413 years ago, the moons of Jupiter, the rings of Saturn, ravished his heart and ours ever since. Then with Herschel, we traveled further into the icy darkness of Uranus and Neptune. When Holst, a hundred years ago, composed his suite to the planets, we saluted Mars, Venus, and even tiny Mercury, but no suite was composed for Earth's blue waters, even after we saw her majestic ascent above the moon's horizon. Earth, our only home, unsung in symphonies, like a mother suckled till her rivers turned to ravens, her snowy tresses a sliver contouring her bare head, her green girdle shorn to stone and dirt, bereft of birds. If I had the gift of conjuring sound to sense, I would pick the shrill cry of the iridescent peacock before a monsoon dance, the sound of April rain gentle on a slushy puddle of old snow and soil, the whispering breeze from the Bay of Bengal, tender on sun-drenched tropical skin. Not the waves of a hurricane, but the gentle ebb and tide of water on a sunny palm fringed shore. The sounds of mating frogs before showers, the promise of more rain for thirsty wells, restoring earth to her plenitude. No more the wild shrieks of despair, but the hope of renewed verdure. Bird song and the flutter of wings breaking the silent canopy of trees. <laughs> so, have, thank you. I have two more, and these are inspired by memories of uh, childhood and my parents. Two years. The Earth has completed nearly two revolutions round the sun since you left. Soon it will be another spring and another new year in Calcutta. The frozen ground in my yard will thaw again to birth crocuses and tulips, which you will never see on the screen of your last Samsung phone through the last pair of glasses now placed in front of your sandalwood smeared smiling photo. The apple trees you loved in our yard, which did not flower two years ago, will bloom again to remind us that it is a different time. A time when you are no longer in the airport in your old Alto, in which my oversized suitcases do not fit. Yet bits of you float in the city air, the voices of other old men and their talk of football. Pele's death and Messi's goals in the last year's final, you would never have missed, even if you happened to be on the north shore of Lake Superior. The earth is older today. The young boy you loved to cuddle is almost as tall as his father, whose hairline is starting to resemble your own. I wait for the robins to return to the nest below our deck, 
where you sat on the green canopied swing and breathed the clean northern air before the chill of fall, your breath one with the universe in our little backyard, the pale ebbing sun, innocent of earth's scourge and lungs of humans soon to shrivel to firewood dust and riverine mud. <clears throat> the last one is home. Take me to the home of my childhood in the street called the Gardener's Garden in my town, where the veranda overlooked a pond of water hyacinth and carp, where my mother planted a bougainvillea vine that painted the white concrete crimson. Take me to the home where on sultry nights we did our homework in candlelight, wiping sweat, where the street dog's barks and the rages of young men out of work were drowned by my mother singing a raga. Take me to the house in Delhi near the oil plant where my mother planted daikon and mustard greens and sent baskets to every home. There were no girls to laugh with, but only the whistles of trains from the roof. Take me to the flat just outside the town where in tiny pots dahlias still bloom, where my mother hand feeds the crow, where after a life of feeding a husband, children and grandchildren, my mother hears the miners chirp as she sips her tea alone. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Jan Carroll. Hello, I am Jan Carroll. I didn't realize we were supposed to be saying why we wrote poetry, so I guess I'll say it tonight because it brings me joy. Um, I'm a poet, I'm a gardener, I'm too close to the mic. Um, and to this morning I saw my first robin, not my first robin ever, but my first robin this year. Um, thanks Julie for putting this together. Um, I just wanna say quickly that I <clears throat> have a new book out that We'll be doing the book launch on April 11th at um, Artisan Forge Studios at 6, so I hope that to see you there. I have three poems. To whom it may not concern, I'm sending back these wrens. They never should have been boxed anyway. What robotic arm gone amok plucked them from the nest next to the fulfillment center, now manned exclusively by robotics? You probably should have your wires looked at. They need food, you know. Live bugs, seed meats, berries, water, air. Somewhere to relieve themselves, the privacy to breathe. I did not order them or anything from you. I wouldn't, won't. I know you are not motivated by salary, not really motivated at all, only motorized. I know they did not program empathy into you and this does not fall under the efficiency directive of your facility, but please put them back in the nook of the tree or under its branches with the fallen leaves, lifeless, limp, impractical, broken though they be, gently. And I think Rose, is, do you remember that from the poetry group? I think we wrote, I wrote that for when I had my, when I led the poetry group that was here at the UU. These next two poems are from a book I wrote um, before the pandemic um, that was about gardening and earth tending called With What's Left. This one is In the Forest. At the visitor's center, the solar system depicted in a line of fabric balloons is strung across the back of the learning space. The ranger in a cheery mood highlights his favorite trails ends up mentioning all of them, estimates how long it will take to traipse along them, notes what we might see. Though my friend and I both have the same map open in our hands, we can't find the trailhead until we ask three people and triangulate. Then we're in the woods, so many dragonflies, white pine, birch, oak, and other trees we weren't sure the names of. I almost step on a leopard skin frog, not seeing it till it jumps. Then I can't make out where it is, it's so camouflaged. Both male and female black swallow butterfly, 
black swallowtail butterflies sun at path's edge. We skirt the river. The weather's good. A cadre of field scientists with nets, clipboards, and sample boxes break for lunch down by the lake. We do too, only at a pub in the village. Then we head out of town again, park on the side of some county road, my friend sure this time exactly where it is. A great blue heron sails over us into the sun. We hike in. It's not long till we hear the roar of waterfall, a fairly steep climb, avoiding poison ivy. At the top, a makeshift shelter of interwoven loom, limbs. Going back, down, we choose our steps carefully. We breathe it all in. I try to make a movie of it with my phone, but it's too big. The tiny device can't capture it. I resolve to just remember, being there in the forest, one with the woods for a while, invigorated and calmed, awe deepened, adventurized, comforted, taken in, sweaty, thirsty, happy, alive. <clears throat> this one is utopiac, like utopia, person who likes utopia, Uto utopiac. You want to believe in undying ingenuity, that some brainiac will wake from a dream state and with only what's in her tool shed and her iPhone, concoct the next combustive derivative, that you might somehow be able to convince everyone to cross the rickety bridge both ways and get along, sit down together, find a way to make it work for everyone. Well, keep trying. That a whiz kid in the desert might train cacti to weep and thus flood the Mojave into new Eden, and it's cost effective, can't be monopolized, colonized, or have its patents stolen and sold to the most corrupted that some new Grandma Moses might be dusting and find synchronicity amidst the bric-a-bac and turn that into synergy that somehow powers your dishwasher while you paint the bucolic scene outside your window. That some flight nut brings back jetpacks that run on angst, iodine, and rainwater and will crowd the skies trying to get around. That the fusion of twine and wire will be the next energy empire. The wingman who figures it out wanting to give in the name a nod to Tesla but the big wigs nix that. That there's got to be that one tink in the worldwide chatter that if unearthed might just, if we cross our fingers hard enough, talk us back from the brink. I too wish the cumulative angels of our better selves could disempower the maniacs. That there might be a way not to have to give all this up. If, if, if. That somehow the sun or the moon or the wind or cheap but colorful scarves tied together and pulled out of some magician's hat will be the answer that means we can keep on living like we are, only better and better and better. Thanks for listening. And next we have Max Garland, uh, my fellow southerner. <laughs> Hello, I'm, uh, I uh, had some things I was going to read, three things, but now I'm looking for all the poems I have that don't have P's or B's in them. <laughs> so I'm trying to, that's what I'm looking for. Um, not that easy to find. Um, let's see. Especially when, for someone who was born in Paducah. and most of my time is gone. <laughs> There's gotta be some in here. Oh, I'm Max Garland, didn't you introduce? Didn't you say that? I, I'm saying that. Spring snow. I guess the snow must love us deeply. Smack in the heart of April, the sharp flakes fall. The branches can't catch them. The snow plows grow sullen. The warblers are stalled 600 miles to the south waiting for rumors of green in the wind. Half of the waters here are open. 
Half are a white waste where mallards brood and crows rehash their guttural alphabets. The snow must believe there's never enough. Whatever we lack, the sky can deliver. Loving not wisely, but a little too well, snow pierces the air like so many pale tattoos. You can't remember why you coveted such flakes as a child, held out your arms, unfurled your tongue. Now all you remember is the bite of spring snow, falling out of love, I guess. Um, you miss it. This is, um, it's interesting how we are being robbed of many things on this earth and even in our own little town and community. One of them is darkness. One of them is the ability, let's say, to see stars, constellations and such as that. Another is silence. The ability to walk down the street without hearing music piped over you uh, to try to ward off any conversation or thought you might have. Um, but, you know, you miss that. You miss loneliness. You miss darkness. You miss them. You miss it. It's less lonely than it used to be. What with the forest stripped down to the minimum now and the white lines painted on the Oakwood Mall lot and the cars parked like brothers and sisters in order of their arrival, the sheen of the Lord upon them, the last as blessed with brightness as the first. It's less lonely without the animals broadcasting their strange sense of themselves as if being were enough if you sang it incessantly from a high enough branch or possibly barked it into the night. It's less lonely without the barking or the baying or the night itself, the small eyes clicking off and on from the brambles, the lit green eyes, the yellow. Though you miss it, the loneliness, the size of it mostly, the way you rose up to meet it in fear and were enlarged somehow by the rising and your own fumbling for sounds, sequences, syllables, to cast yourself like a spell into the midst of something you neither made nor imagined nor could keep from imagining. Anyway, that's my answer to why I write poetry. Um, and then, looking after. This is for my mother. This is a fairly new poem. I've only read it once. Um, looking after. The bees were counting on us not to kill them, but nobody's perfect and also the pandas and sunflower sea stars and grandparents, not to mention the frogs in the lovely muck of marshes and wrens of the underbrush. Such an intricate ordeal untying the knot of self and then to find how far the self expands beyond her former borders. Who will nurture a mind worth half the time it took to construct the orbits of atoms and corral the particles into memory enough to house the hum of the world in spite of the sting, the wear and tear? Who will treat this world, the beaten waves, smoldering woods, and blue cleavings of ice, the way the oldest proverbs commanded all wanderers be treated, 
shake out the sheets, dust off the good plates. Bless his heart, my mother might have said, of a rain-drenched dog or red bird dazed by the window glass, which I understood was a tender command that something needed looking after for an hour, a day, as long as we lived. Who will treat this world the way her God insisted we treat the drenched, bedraggled, estranged, and strangely familiar, whose hurt is ours until it's over? Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Laurel Kiefer. So when I was getting ready to come and, and uh, read with, with you tonight, I was thinking about what, it, what is my background with nature? And I realized that I have lived on a farm for all of my life for except for about seven years. And those seven years that I didn't live on the farm, I was working as a U, working with University Extension and working with farm families. So my entire life has been encapsulated by the interconnectedness and the relationship of working and living the farm life. And so um, I currently manage, own, have privileged, privileged, there's that P again, Max, I got all the time. Um, and privileged to have the opportunity to live in harmony on a 100 acre um, piece of property in Northern Triple County that is, is absolutely a stunning, stunning piece of property. And so it's um, really pretty much every day there's something that occurs in my daily routine that I want to write down or I want to remember. And so um, what I'm reading with you tonight is really not a poem, but it's a, it, I've, I've heard it, my work labeled as poetic prose in the past. And so that I'll be sharing with you. And it's, and it's um, called My Winter Love Affair. It's quiet. Not the absence of sound, but the quiet of gentle fall, snow falling at dusk, grabbing the last bits of light and refracting them in glistening glitter. The great horned owl calls out in subtle hoots from the evergreens that frame the southern edge of my property. The pond ice crackles and pops in response to the warm days and the cold nights that foretell the coming of spring. A single line in the snow transverse, transverses the pond from the wooded valley east of my house all the way to the pines the telltale trail of a lone coyote's nocturnal travels. The peaceful ambience of the moment embraces me. I continue my walk to the house, reviewing my pre-storm preparations while hoping that I will need very few of them. Have I gathered enough food and water to provide for the needs of the chickens, ducks, and guineas should we lose power? What about the llama, sheep, and the donkeys? And, of course, the dogs and the cats. Will the curtain blocking three-foot snowdrifts? Will the curtain blocking the three-foot snowdrifts from entering the donkey shelter hold up? Will I be able to get the skid steer out of the barn in the morning to plow things out? Once in the house, I take a mental snapshot of my own needs. Let's see: cistern water for the toilets, fresh water for drinking, cooking, and personal hygiene. The firewood bin is stocked full. Flashlights, candles, food. My pantry is stocked full of rosy red jars of tomatoes, ratatouille, pizza sauce, pickles, and more. Keeping myself fed and warm is of little concern as my needs are minuscule compared to the needs of the animals. These moments ground me in satisfaction for the year-round efforts linked to living this, uh, this farm life and lifelong goals to work in partnership with this microcosm of our planet. While making supper, I recall previous snowstorms where an early fall blizzard stranded the rams out in the back valley. With a bucket and gray of grain in hand, we trudged back through fresh 15-inch deep snowdrifts 
and this was before we had snowshoes, to bring the maroon sheep back into the fold. Another time I recall taking hay and grain out to a group of ewes using the kids' mini-boggins. We used to winter groups of sheep out in the far valleys. After one particularly heavy snow, we couldn't find the sheep. In a bit of a panic, we called for them, and suddenly the entire hillside started to move in subtle waves. The sheep stood up with eight inches of snow on their backs, shook their heads, and made their way to us as if nothing were unusual about the situation. I settled in for the rest of the evening, cuddling with my dog, Bella, in front of the wood stove. The 10 o'clock weather report reveals nothing new, so Bella and I head upstairs to bed. We both fall asleep to the soft patter of snow landing on the skylights in the metal roof. At dawn, I roll over to look out the large windows of my bedroom. The morning light brings me glimpses of the day's work ahead. The view across the valley's pristine snow is a picture-perfect winter scene in March. A dozen cardinals hover around the feeders. The bright scarlet males pop against the blinding brightness of, snow, of sun against snow. Chickadees, juncos, woodpeckers, goldfinches, nuthatches, and sparrows jostle around the cardinals and below the feeders to grab what morsels they can before the domineering blue jays come and claim the space. This morning's robust burst of energy bears little resemblance to last night's quiet before the snow. Reluctantly, I come back to the reality of first getting out of the house and then clearing a path to the barn to begin my morning chores. Alexa lets me know that this mid-morning, mar mid-March cloudy day offers me 19 degrees with a wind chill of four. The zipper on my coverall is getting grumpy from too many ups and downs this long winter. The back door has drifted shut, snow envelopes the snowblower leaving the red and black handles to mark its location. Once I've dug out the back door, I trudge my way to the barn. The dogs hear me working my way towards them. They bark, the donkeys bray, and the sheep start to baa. I can hear the roosters crow, the guinea hens squawk, and the chickens cackle. A single tabby cat, raccoon, works his way through the drifts to come for his morning snuggle and tummy rub. The animals always greet me with enthusiasm. I am their source of food, water, health care, and shelter, and they all know it. There is this occasional special treat that they will clamor over each other to grab, out of, grab from my hands. This particular morning, there are two new sets of twin lambs born during the morning hours and all doing well. Everyone else seems good and ready to get on with their day. They have no concerns if I can get my car or my 2000 Chevy Silverado out of the driveway, that the mailbox has been slammed open by the snowplow, that it will take me several hours to clear away enough snow to feed them their big bale of hay, or that I'm running short on grain and need to get to the feed mill. They all just look at me with large, lucid eyes, and I smile back at them. This life on the farm is not for the weak of back or spirit. As I disperse a 50-pound bag of grain into two pails, I wonder, ponder how long my mid-60-year-old body is meant to continue this farm journey. The weather extremes bring wonder and joy, but not without ample effort and some sacrifice. While chiseling out the, the frozen 50-gallon water tub, I one ponder how many of the sometimes subtle, sometimes blatant elements of my farm life I would miss without the daily routines. The predictable calamity of my relationship with the animals gets me going every morning. It's twice a day, six-month love affair. When the first buds of spring finally poke through the frozen ground, the animals will have to share me with the orchards and the gardens, but that's another story for another season. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Jesse Peters. see how much noise I can possibly make before actually reading. <laughs> I'm Jessie Peterson. I write poetry 
because I, like Laurel, am lucky enough to have a space that I've lived with for 40 plus years, and every day there is something new and different, something to be noticed and documented, and a reason to play with language. This first one I wrote just a couple of weeks ago. It's called Vernal Equinox. It's a desperate time of year, mounds of snow still smothering, silencing even our thoughts. Deer high step through the drifts, congregating on the south facing slope below the house. Last year's high bush cranberries and crab apples have been picked naked, spruces trimmed up past my height. Along the roadside, the seed eaters pick through the gravel, a drift of snow buntings gusting up in a bright storm against the clotted gray curls from the plow. Walking on fresh snow out to the mailbox, a lone turkey has been there before me, leaving a trail of arrows pointing back the way we've come. This next one uh, came out of a prompt that my uh, poetry circle uh, gave each other during pandemic. Uh, I'm sure it's probably got a, a proper name like uh, Abbasidarian poem, uh, but we called them All Bessie Can Do poems. <laughs> because one of our poems started with that line. So the, the rule is that each successive word uh, starts with the next letter of the alphabet. Aggregate, black crows descend, edging forest, gangs huddled in jangled kibitz, lost, mourning near oblivion, past quorum, rarely sonorous, Though under vellum, winter exed yellow zinnias. Uh, I, on our property, I host a uh, trail cam for the DNR that um, documents what wildlife is on our property, and it helps uh, the DNR decide uh, what to do with wildlife management, how many. Uh, fawns are born in any given year, and um, people across the state uh, host trail cams and um, gather that data and uh, send it on to the DNR. And uh, we're supposed to do it at least once every three months. I was supposed to actually go and do it today, but I decided I would put it off until next weekend, and hopefully Meltage will have <laughs> made, made my trek down the hill a little easier. Checking the trail cam. Beyond my window, January snowflakes sift and drift like mica shards of sky, trailing slow and fat until, caught in a sudden updraft, they flow lazily toward the eaves. Maple tops rooted deep in the seepage swamp below the hill sway and shiver, but on my screen, September light catches sumac starting to turn, and goldenrod glows above the soft ripple of the slough. I wade through all the sets of breeze-whipped leaves triggering the shutter, sort does and June fawns just now losing their spots from the antlered bucks, catalog the sly lope of coyote at night, the low slink of fox down the back bank to drink. Sunrises spangle the crest of the opposite river bank, sparkle on new snow as the year deepens to dark, and the slough grows a thickening skin of ice, silently awaiting the silken slip and glide of otters romping, their sleek bellies on the snow, penning icy lyrics for the wind to sing. Then I'm going to finish with one uh, that comes out of an event 
uh, that's coming up here April 16th uh, over by Stevens Point, the Wisconsin Prairie Chicken Festival uh, held in honor of Frederick and Francis Hammerstrom, who were naturalists uh, very eager to preserve habitat for Wisconsin's only um, prairie grouse, the prairie chicken. Uh, they were students of Aldo Leopold's, and um, so you can go, there's just a very small population of prairie chickens left, and they have very particular habits. They uh, will only mate on one little space called a lek, and uh, only in this next couple of weeks. Sand County. We trudge through last year's corn stubble in a wayward, straggling line, drunken with the hour and the cold. It's April, 4 a.m., the air metallic in our noses. We stoop low, clamber awkwardly into plywood boxes, slouching in slush. Six strangers cram together on a rough, grainy bench. We sit in silence, slurping coffee or inhaling its steam, ears straining. There's a guy who doesn't get it, two blinds over, nattering on in the face of shushing. To block him from my mind, I try to remember poems I memorized in fourth grade, one each week. The roads in a yellow wood, the fog with cat feet, the wild geese told to go. But I stop when I get to the one about the prairie. You know, clover and a bee. And reverie, broken now by a series of eerie, otherworldly humming whoops. The talker two doors down shuts up, and we gingerly open the viewing hatches. Dawn has crept out across the winter matted grass, and one by one, the prairie chickens we've come to see venture into the open, each male claiming a little circle of grace to stomp around on, orange air sacs ballooning beneath his chin, a spiky feather crest rearing up behind his head. They dance alone, each angling for the best spot, booming their bizarre, buzzing love call endlessly. We all wait for the girl who never comes, not this morning at any rate. A harrier sweeps over on silent gray wings, breaks the undulating spell of sound, sends the chickens into the tall grass like scattershot. We stumble out of our blinds and back across the field to cold cars. I warm my fingers, numb from gripping binoculars against the heater. I decide that Emily Dickinson didn't know Dick Sissel about the prairie. <laughs> How could she? Cloistered in a white Amherst salt box where arching chestnuts and elms framed her world. Here in the sand counties, there is no frame, just a bending ocean of grass under a skim milk sky. We have three more poets, and um, as you know, April is uh, National Poetry Month, and it's also uh, a time to focus on Earth Day. And um, so our next poet will be Erna Kelly. Um, I also didn't know I was supposed to say why I write poetry, but I actually was thinking about this this morning <laughs> during singing meditation, and I'm trying this out. I think poetry is like a meditation for me, writing poetry. Uh, this first poem, uh, there, you know, there's the adage, when you go out in nature, leave no trace. Well, that's impossible. <laughs> it's, it's a lovely goal, but it's, it's not possible. But 
you can leave lesser traces <laughs> rather than greater traces. And this poem looks at a couple of ways of being in nature. Forget me not. One, I can't write. I can't write because I can't hear. I haven't listened because I'm afraid of what the wind will say. Afraid I won't know how to turn it around. It might swallow me, so I hold off the flood at my ear. Two, if I run, run, run like you, I'll never hear the wind words. I'll never know the water wishes. I'll pile up papers like little gold stars, like the book reports you gave in third grade. Keep busy, keep busy, keep busy. Three, dead isn't still. Dead is incessant, repetitive motion. Casting, casting, casting into a pool without stopping to take in its light. Dead is the lap, lap, lap of constant paddling, the crunch of stones and crumble of clay beneath your feet. Lucky the forget-me-nots remember to stay, rooted, and that you only pass over them once. They remember the sky and unfold upward again, slowly, silently, as the noise of your boot fades away. Uh, this second poem was written uh, during a vision and word collaboration with Christina Yaka, and she was doing a piece based on one of my other poems, and I would go over to her uh, porch to visit her and visit the piece she was working on over the summer, and she was using a lot of layers, which is very painstakingly done, and... Um, plastering, layers of plaster, and she wanted something to give it bulk. And so she told me she was putting straw in there. And she said, sand is too heavy, and I want you to know no frac sand was used. <laughs> <laughs> so this poem, um, if, if poets are seers, I never feel I am, except maybe in this poem. Um, the, you know, so the people who argued for frac sand mining, oh, it's going to be an economic boon for us. Well... Yes, sure. And uh, train traffic picked up. Um, some people did get jobs with sand mining, but we know what has happened since then. No frac sand used. This piece is safe to gaze on without being disturbed by what is and will be happening. Hills bored into by bulldozers across the Mississippi from Wabasha, piles of sand ready for barges, sand slipping into the river, silting, it, silting the gills of fish, fish dying, riverbed drying. Sand blows in the air into lungs, our lungs, and the lungs of animals on land sandwiched in between farms sold out to mining companies. I used to love the sound of a train whistle, an occasional treat once or twice a day. Now it is frequent, and each time I suck in my breath, let it out, and feel shriveled like a spent balloon. Because we live in a state that allows corporations to take the sand and the money and run. And um, I want to li leave with a um, poem about nature's resilience. Uh, last, this was written last spring, we had very slow cold spring and then after soaring heat. Um, but the plants seem to have their own inbuilt um, clock. Implanted. The click of plant clocks is steady conveying seasonal certitude you can count on, despite the weather made by an overheated planet. In early May, iris blades peep from the ground, heighten as daylight lengthens, stalks along with them, and green buds grow purple, ready to pop, to announce a new month, and to punctuate the end of the old. Ignoring this year's roller coaster, 
of callous cold and searing heat, they slowly unwind the spring action of their mechanisms. Thank you. Now we're going to hear from Karen Lowe. Greetings, I'm Karen Loeb, and I'm going to read three poems, and the first one, uh, I didn't know that Julie was going to be here, but uh, she performed this poem with uh, her wonderful looping music about a year or two ago, and um, I chose it because it has a planet in it, and um, and I would like to make a comment or two about it afterwards, but I don't know if I will. Anyhow, this is my rendition of it. Now that Pluto is no longer a planet, what else will be taken away? Will it disappear like my rattan doll buggy with the Isinglass windows in the bonnet? Like mail delivery on the last Sunday before Christmas? Like all my Oz books, stored in an attic that no longer exists, like the stuffed hawk that watched over them, like my wind-up elephant covered in yellow velvet skin, a mechanical wonder with legs, tail, trunk, and ears that moved on its journey across the living room floor, like all the waiting pools, like conductors taking your tickets on city trains, like coal bins in every basement on the block, like delivery men at dawn leaving their crates filled with butter, cheese, and milk in glass bottles with a cardboard stopper and fluted paper top. Like miniature glass cream pitchers in every restaurant, like all the umbrellas I have scattered in North America, Asia, and beyond. Like all the spools of black thread I can never find when I need one like the mystery of answering a phone with no caller ID, like my father calling to give his orchard report, three more kumquats appeared, like my brother's bottle of Vitalis hair tonic, like Pluto, still out there in the galaxy, spinning as always, trying to play the game and keep up with its bigger siblings, redubbed a dwarf planet. Everything is in the name. I wanted to mention that um, when I read the poem over, I thought, am I just being nostalgic? Um, I hope not. Um, but I w began to think that back then, and I'm a city person, I'm exactly the opposite of Jesse and Laurel. I've, I've lived in cities all my life, and Chicago is the place that I started out with. and. I was thinking that, okay, the coal furnaces, that's good that they're gone. Um, they, they weren't healthy. Um, but the glass bottles, the milk being delivered, um, and then what I didn't put in here, I remember going to grocery stores uh, and taking pop bottles back, and you, you got a penny or, or something for the pop bottle. And how we didn't even call that recycling, like that was what you did. And so it's not nostalgia, but it's looking back and seeing the things that didn't work, like the coal furnaces um, and, and all that stuff that I breathed in for a long time uh, growing up. And, um, and then all the other things that were good that we just, you know, because of plastic, we just abandon it. And, so that's what I thought of when I reread this poem. And then I'm going to read two more slightly shorter poems. They both involve my daughter. It just happens that way. And I'll read this one last. Um, so this one is called I Have a Question. And it's, it's a list poem of sorts like the last one. Um, and I combined a whole bunch of questions that she asked over the years. They didn't come one after the other, but I, they, they all sound like they do. 
and, um, and I'll talk about one very briefly afterwards. I have a question. Questions pile up like a mound of winter coats left on the bed by the guests, glad to be in from the cold. Questions like, where's my backpack, and who ate all the cornbread, and can I let the cat out if I promise to watch her in the yard? We have a break for dinner, then they resume. When's the piano tuner coming? You know that key of E is sticky, and why can't I find any pencils around here? Math doesn't work with ink pens. And where's my band shirt? I have to have it for tomorrow, and how did all this get here? Meaning, waving her, sweeping her arm through the air, meaning the earth and the universe. It's a steady stream, an endless supply of why and where that settles around us like fog, weaving over the landscape, floating on the shoulders of our couch and chair. And it was her question of, how did all this get here? Where does it come from? She was four when she asked that question, and she was sitting at the dining room table looking out this big bank of windows we had in our antique house. Where does it all come from? Where does it all come from? And I'm thinking, oh. And so I started talking to her about the Big Bang Theory. And <laughs> because that's what she was talking about. Of course, she didn't understand anything I was saying, but, but that's what she meant. She was wondering not where did this table come from, but where does it come from? And I thought that was great, and that inspired the poem. And then uh, the last one. On the drive home, we admire the cosmos, my daughter exclaiming over the silver object in the sky. So close, she says, she could reach out and grab it. But we tell her it's probably a planet. And I see a moon large and mottled, mottled white hovering over our house, a slightly lopsided balloon. And my husband tells us that soon it will be light at this time, 6 o'clock, barely night. Really, there's so much to look forward to when your eyes lift to the sky. Thank you. And our final poet is Woody Myers. Good evening. Um, I have to start by just saying, obviously, I'm Woody Myers. I feel a little bit uh, humbled, the fact that I'm here in the, the uh, company of so many very good poets. Um, I am very much a novice myself, so I'll ask that you please be gentle. <laughs> um, so I'm a geologist by education, uh, my trade, and by passion. Um, I work protecting our groundwater from polluters. Um, can be a very frustrating job because people think that somehow uh, economics is more important than our future. Um, although one of my passions with geology is, is paleontology and understanding how this huge world that we're in, how it came to be. So I think you'll probably understand that a little better in my poem, which compared to some is going to be very brief. So come and listen. She has a story to tell. Mountain and river tree and sky. She is a house that is also a home where art and science collaborate. Time moves forward and the old is put off. Trilobite, tiktaalik, snail and whale. Time moves forward and the new is put on. Some things change, but always slowly. She hasn't told us everything. We have to search. Look and see, think and learn. She tells us each a little, so we all have to work together. Where the story she tells is for all. In failing to live in step with her, we destroy ourselves.
Thank you to everyone who shared their beautiful words tonight. And I know that um, poetry has always moved me to be a better person and to hear everyone's words provide us inspiration to notice, pay attention, and be in the present moment. We have a, another forum in May. I hope you'll join us. Um, for those of you who have been seeing news about chat GBT, <laughs> you might be interested in our technology and futurism uh, forum, which will talk about the future of technology and what it might mean for our planet and humanity. Uh, we'll have uh, John DeRickery, um, our uh, own Rob Brian Nelson, who's back there, and Kelly Berry. So that will be on May 18th. So let's give everybody a round of applause and yeah. hope you'll celebrate Earth Day every day and remember May is no mo May. So um, happy National Poetry Month. Go in peace.